get started. Um, I'm super excited to share our topic for today, um, an engineering manager's tips for increasing autonomy and reducing noise. Super excited to have Jad here from Forethought share his tips and tricks for how he scaled with his business. Um, my name is Dorothy. I work on the marketing team at Century and will be your host for today. A um, couple housekeeping notes before we get into it. Um, this will be recorded, so feel free to take notes if you'd like, but we will share this out with everyone who has attended, as well as people who couldn't make it for today. So if you have some colleagues that couldn't join in, we will share this out with everyone so that they can watch it afterwards. Um, but definitely feel free to take whatever notes you'd like. Um, and then we definitely want to make this interactive and engaging. So please definitely use the chat function and the Q&A at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom platform. Um, definitely ask questions throughout. We will definitely have time for some questions and whatnot after um, the presentation is over. Um, so definitely do that. And then uh, there will be a quick survey. It takes two seconds to complete at the end of this that will pop up on your screen. If everyone can do me a favor and just fill that out, it would be incredibly helpful to me and the team just to figure out how we can better serve you guys um, in these workshops and make the content as relevant as we can. Um, and with that, with that being said, um, our quick agenda for today, I will obviously introduce our wonderful speakers. Um, and then Forethought will, Jad from Forethought will share his story of kind of the before and after century, as well as walk through his actual workflow. Um, and then Adam will take it over and do a demo. And then we will obviously end with Q&A as well. So definitely use that function, um, the Q&A or the chat throughout the, uh, the time we have today. Um, and that being said, again, super excited to have Jad here, our engineering manager from Forethought, as well as Adam, who is our solutions engineer from the Century side to share their stories with you today. Um, Jad, I will let you take it from here. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dorothy. Um, nice to see everyone here. Um, uh, as, as Dorothy said, my name is uh, Chad. I'm an engineering manager here at Forethought. I uh, run the uh, core engineering team. Um, a bit about what you do at Forethought. Uh, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so, uh, uh, Forethought uses AI to transform customer, uh, uh, customer service with human-centered AI. Uh, so, we have a few product, product on the market that uh, use machine learning in order to uh, help uh, reduce the load on uh, customer service and help uh, customer service teams achieve uh, better experiences with their uh, support agents. Uh, what uh, Core Engineering specifically does, uh, we work on common services between uh, all teams and uh, and uh, we support the infrastructure, the DevOps, uh, data engineering, and we build internal tools. Uh, uh, and uh, in addition to that, we also uh, maintain uh, fast API. Uh, uh, a lot of the work that we do internally is uh, uh, contributing to fast API uh, whenever there are features that we need. And then uh, we, usually, we always run the latest version of fast API internally. Uh, so that's a bit about forethought, a bit about my team, what my team does, um, a bit about our stack. Uh, our stack is uh, we run everything on AWS. Uh, we we use uh, Kubernetes. Everything runs inside of containers, and uh, we use Flux for uh, GitOps. Uh, I saw there's a few DevOps people here. Uh, so for uh, managing our infrastructure stack uh, inside of Kubernetes, we use uh, Flux in order to reconcile and uh, deploy our uh, infrastructure services. Uh, we use Spinnaker for continuous delivery for people that aren't familiar with Spinnaker. Spinnaker is a continuous delivery platform that was built by Netflix and open source. Um, and uh, we usually use Spinnaker uh, for to deploy our internal services, so the services that we build ourselves, our microservices gets to get deployed through Spinnaker. Regarding our persistent storage, uh, we use MongoDB. Uh, MongoDB, uh, we run that uh, in a multi-region uh, architecture uh, across three different regions for high availability and disaster recovery. Um, we also use Redis. Redis, we use it for cache as well as uh, messaging for dispatching jobs. Uh, we also use Elasticsearch very heavily. Uh, it will definitely pop up as we uh, go over the demo in a, in a bit. Um, 
And then as far as our programming stack, we, uh, we, all of our backend is based on Python. Uh, we use FastAPI, uh, as I mentioned just before, and uh, uh, FastAPI serves uh, most of our API calls. Uh, we have a few, uh, uh, we have one internal API that uh, uses uh, Flask because of templating. Uh, and uh, we use Pydantic a lot for people that aren't familiar with Pydantic. I was introduced to Pydantic uh, about a year ago, and uh, it's been life changing for us. We've uh, gone and refactored a lot, of, a lot of our code base to be based on Pydantic, and uh, it helped us uh, have good typing uh, within Python. Uh, so uh, definitely something that I would recommend, and it works very nicely with Fast API for people that are familiar with Fast API. Uh, regarding our front end, uh, our front end is built on React, Redux for uh, uh, for uh, for store and TypeScript. Uh, the team at Forthought on engineering, we're about 40 engineers today. Um, we serve about 52 million requests per day. And uh, again, everything runs in containers and we use AWS to host our, uh, uh, to host all of our services. <clears throat> now a bit about our growth and, and, and how we got to where we are today and, and what were our challenges. Uh, we were six engineers about two years ago. Uh, today we are 40 engineers. Uh, by the end of the year, we are planning to double that and become a, become a, become around 75 engineers. Uh, so what happened as we went from six to 40 engineers? Uh, we noticed that uh, first of all, when we were six, we were doing one sprint planning, one retrospective, uh, and it, it obviously worked very well. Uh, when we started getting to the threshold to about 15 people. Uh, it started becoming painful. A lot of people were in sprint plannings, hearing about work that's completely irrelevant to their job. Uh, and this is where uh, we started thinking, okay, it's time to start splitting our sprint planning, start splitting our teams. Uh, so we went into splitting our teams from one team into five teams. Uh, that's when we hit this threshold of about 25 engineers where we went into this full split into teams. Today, we are five teams. In the beginning, it was uh, two or three teams, and then we started going from there. Um, now, with that, it was it was a good change from a, from a project management and tracking perspective. Uh, but what we didn't uh, forecast was uh, how do we determine the ownership of issues that are happening in production. Uh, now that we have multiple teams, the teams of, are obviously uh, uh, in communication between each other, but once an issue is happening in production, it became harder and harder to determine what team is responsible for that issue. And this is where we started looking into other ways of, of, of tackling things. Uh, the JIRA backlog was starting to get very noisy, uh, especially when we had multiple projects uh, in the JIRA backlog. We would have issues all over JIRA uh, that some of them are related to Sentry issues, uh, but we couldn't keep track of them. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't measure our health of releases. We release very often, but how do we know that our, our releases are going well? How do we know that it's time for rollbacks? Uh, and this is where we started looking into uh, how do we increase the ownership and reduce the noise uh, that we get. Uh, and this is where uh, code owners uh, within Sentry uh, became handy. So uh, going over our workflow and to how we used to do that before we uh, before we started with code owners. Uh, I'll talk a bit about code owners on the next slide, but uh, before we had this uh, uh, the separation, we a bug would get uh, uh, a bug would get reported in Sentry. Uh, we have this rule that I'll go over in just a bit, uh, that uh, if an issue happens more than a few times per hour, uh, uh, we, it raises a non-call escalation. That has been uh, a lifesaver for us uh, because uh, it helps us determine, or this is, this is an important issue that needs to be tackled. Um, and But the, the problem was for the issues that don't happen um, more than let's say 10 times per hour, uh, those are still issues. Those are probably also affecting clients at some point. Uh, those would usually go unnoticed and uh, they go into this large backlog of Sentry issues and they are all unassigned and unresolved. Uh, usually what would happen before is 
and then like engineers, engineering managers would go in and check Sentry. If, if something pops up that, oh, this is interesting, we should look into that, then it would get tackled, but that wouldn't happen as often, uh, especially as we're moving fast, we're releasing new features, uh, we, we're growing very fast. So a lot of people are coming in with little context. Uh, so the way we issues would get escalated is from our customer success teams. Uh, our customer success team would tell us like, oh, hey, there's an issue here that the client is reporting. And for us, this was the worst thing that we could have. We never want that uh, uh, that to happen. If there's an issue, we need to know about it as soon as possible and roll it back. Um, and so once a customer success uh, manager reports that issue, we create the JIRA ticket and we resolve it as soon as possible. We needed to figure out a better way in order to tackle those issues faster and in a more efficient manner. Uh, the problem was, as an engineer or an engineering manager was starting to uh, look at uh, uh, look at the, the the big backlog, we would have trouble uh, figuring out: is this my team? Is this the other team? Uh, and then it would kind of go into a ping pong uh, kind of game. So going into what happens after code owners. So code owners at a glance is a feature that allows us to sync our code owners in GitHub. Uh, so in GitHub, we define a code owner file that uh, says based on each path, what is, uh, what is the, uh, who is the owner? Who is the team that's owner in GitHub? Uh, in Sentry, we link our the Sentry teams to our GitHub teams. And uh, from there, we just import our code owners. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about our code owners when I get into the demo, but the workflow having that just changed our workflow dramatically. Uh, once a bug is now reported, uh, a sentry issue is created, it gets automatically triaged based on our code owners. That allows us to, uh, once an issue happens multiple times, we kept that. This, is, this hasn't changed. This has been a flow that has worked well for us. We have kept it that uh, a non-call escalation fires. We have future improvement that we, we want to be doing uh, that I'll talk about as well today. Um, but as we started going, uh, uh, as we started triaging those issues systematically based on code owners, uh, that meant that uh, when an issue is opened, it gets assigned to a team. Now we notify the Slack channel of that team. So that team also knows uh, like there's a core engineering Slack channel that monitors all the sentry issues that happen. And we also uh, uh, started having workflows internally that let us determine uh, uh, and keep track of our sentry, uh, sentry issues. Like for example, we have things that we call sentry audits. A sentry audit happens uh, every Monday. Uh, and the reason why is we have one week sprints and we do those uh, Monday before our sprint planning. Uh, before I was sprint planning, we usually spent half an hour. Whoever was on call in the previous week would share their screen and we would go over our sentry backlog. What happened last week? Is there anything we need to tackle this week? And then we create JIRA issues from those sentry issues. And then we go and uh, uh, we go to the sprint planning right after, and then we add them to the sprint planning. This has allowed us to first keep a, a sense of ownership for whoever is on call to keep track of those sentry issues. Uh, and, and it allows us to keep sentry uh, in control. All the team is aware of the sentry issues that are happening because we get to discuss them every Monday. And that has become kind of a normal thing for us. Uh, just like how we always did sprint planning, now sentry audit is just the first meeting of the week and we just do that. And then that became a really good, uh, addition uh, to our just weekly schedules. <clears throat> now, once the Jira ticket is, cre is created, we go into sprint planning right after. We tackle the we can tackle the issue in the upcoming sprint, uh, obviously based on priority, and then the issue is resolved. Now, every once in a while, obviously this is a very ideal process. Every once in a while, we we fall back, uh, especially when we are releasing. Uh, new features, and at that point, what uh, what we would do is uh, we we have something called a bug bash. Uh, a bug bash is basically a sprint or two sprints that we spend just fixing bugs. And uh, by the end of that sprint, the ideal uh, scenario would be to get into a Linux zero where there is no sentry issues. Uh, that's very challenging. Uh, we we being honest, we haven't gotten to that, uh, but that's kind of the target. And uh, uh, we tackle all our, all our bugs, but what's very important and the mistake that we have done in the past is that 
after we've done the bug bash, we're like, okay, we're, we're good now. We have, we've tackled a lot of the issues, especially the low hanging fruits. And then we kind of slack off for, for a few weeks, a few months later, but then we get in, back into a bad spot. So it's very important. Uh, and that's what we've learned that after doing those bug bashes and tackling those issues, keeping uh, uh, the follow-up. And this is how the century audits came in. And we started figuring out that actually doing this incremental follow-up and the century audits was more impactful than every once in a while, just stopping everything doing a bug bash and then going back into uh, uh, going back uh, into uh, uh, the century audits. So uh, that's how our workflow uh, became after using code owners. Uh, I'm gonna go over a live run of uh, what my workflow looks like, what my team's workflow uh, looks like on Sentry. Uh, Dorothy, if you don't mind. All right, um, so uh, starting here, I'm just looking at, uh, I've kind of handpicked an issue here. So I'm looking at my, uh, we have filters that are saved that are by team. So again, all of the, all of the issues uh, get automatically triaged. So whenever I'm looking at my team's issues, I would look at under my team's filter. Uh, in this case, I'm just, I just took one issue as an example. Uh, now I'm looking into this issue first. What's what's really handy here is that I see there's already a, a, a Jira issue open for that. So for from here, I can go into that Jira issue and then I can see the status of that Jira issue. Uh, I can see what's going on and 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 if it's already in a sprint, if not, then I, I know I need to go and check with the team what's going on and make sure it goes into an upcoming sprint. Um, now from here, I can go into uh, the issue itself. Releases have been very helpful for us uh, within Sentry. So within 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 Sentry within this within this issue here, I see on the right uh, that this issue was first seen seven days ago with our 2.0.112 release. Uh, from here, I can go into go into that and dig more, and then I can see what where the file changed and what actually caused that, which makes it way easier for uh, whoever is on call, whoever is investigating an issue to know, okay, this line of code actually caused that issue to start happening. Uh, uh, so from the releases, I can see the commits, see the files changed and, and, and look into uh, narrow down exactly what could have caused this issue to start happening. Um, but what's really more important here and going back to code owners, uh, this issue, when it first when when it was first opened, it got automatically assigned to core engineering here. And the reason why it was automatically assigned to code engineering is because of code owner. So when I hover here over code engineering, I see that it matched uh, core engineering code ownership uh, uh, rule. And uh, because we own the backend integrations mod module, that meant that it got automatically assigned to us. So this has been very helpful. It wasn't only helpful on the Sentry side, it was also helpful and a good exercise for us to keep our code owners in a good, uh, in a good spot uh, on GitHub. Uh, so it forces us to keep updating our code owners on GitHub and also because we are also getting the benefit of automatically triaging our issues on, uh, on Sentry. <clears throat> So um, going, uh, and, and, and in addition to that as well is uh, the fact that we are centrally managing this code ownership in Git uh, helps us a lot rather than having two source of truths and then we have to update those two source of truths. That would have been very painful for us to keep up to date. Most probably it would have been kind of drifted and, and, and out of date. Uh, now from that, we can, we can actually follow the trace, uh, which is also very helpful when debugging API calls. So here I see that the trace, uh, uh, this specific transaction, uh, a transaction is uh, the, the equivalent of an API call. Uh, it's just the measure of an API call on Sentry performance. And then I can see here that uh, it took 320 milliseconds. I see that we return a 502. We enrich all of our Sentry errors and Sentry transactions. It's actually very easy through the Python SDK to just add tags part of a request. We usually do that part of our authentication layer. 
uh, we just inject like what, what org ID, for example, this was. Uh, so in this case, I know which org ID it is. Org IDs are just identifiers of our clients. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'm, I see that we return the 502. We, uh, we have, this was affecting this specific org. Uh, I can either go into the summary and then dig more into what this issue, uh, uh, how many times we had a failure rate on that on that specific uh, API call, uh, how many times we are getting transactions, so transaction per minute. Um, so if we have a high failure rate, then something is off. Uh, so here, for example, on March 29, something has gone off because we got into a 17% failure rate. And all of those are configurable through alerts as well. So as we figure out, all right, a failure rate of more than 2% is something we don't want to tolerate, then we set up alerts from Sentry to fire our on-call escalations. Uh, here we can also see what is actually the slowest part of our request. Uh, and uh, in this case, it is uh, uh, it is Elasticsearch. So this is something worth looking into. If I were to look into that specific trace itself, I can go directly into that transaction. And then from that transaction, I can see what was the API call that was made, what was the transaction, and then all the headers and all the API call and and all the all the. Uh, parts of that ABI call. So this gives me a way to first identify where, where exactly the issue came from and where uh, and how to replicate it, uh, which is by far the most important part of investigating an issue like that. So this is mostly how we tackle issues. Now from here comes alerting. Uh, alerting is very important. And um, I mentioned briefly before the, the rule of uh, and if an event happens more than X times. For us, what we identified as a good number is 10 times. So this is a rule that we have where if an, if an event happens more than 10 times in production, we fire an Ops Genie alert. And Ops Genie is the equivalent of pager duty if you're familiar with that. It's just a non-call uh, on-call rotation system. Uh, and we, we use those, uh, uh, we just fire an alert on Ops Genie Again, 10 times, I think every single team should define what uh, what works for them. Uh, 10 times has worked for us uh, uh, for a while. It hasn't been too noisy to the point where we're firing escalations that shouldn't be handled, but at the same time, where there hasn't been issues that needed direct attention that, hasn't, that has gone unnoticed. But along with code owners, we can also take alerting to, uh, to the next step. So since, since since when a new issue is getting opened, it's getting automatically triaged uh, through code owners, then we have alerts set up like this one. Uh, so here what I'm saying is that if uh, any issue that happens, uh, if it's assigned to the core engineering team and the event environment is production, I want this to send the Slack message to core services Sentry. What this allows us to do is, now we have a way to, uh, to just notify the core engineering team of every single issue that is happening within uh, that team, uh, and we're not there's no noise from other teams as well, uh, and and it allows us to have side discussions on Slack if we need to about what do we like is there anything we need to improve or just have a sense of how things are going if there's anything weird happening in our environments. So this is how we used alerting in our environments, and uh, it has been going uh, pretty well for us. There's definitely a few things we would want to improve, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Now, going into our internal tools, uh, we've also used uh, the Sentry API to enrich our internal tools. So I, we have uh, connectors platforms. Uh, connectors are... Uh, uh, basically a way for our clients to ingest data from their data sources, whether that's Confluence, Zendesk. In this case, I took Zendesk as an example. Uh, and we build internal tools uh, uh, in order to have our solution architects, uh, core engineers, or, uh, or implementation engineers look into, those, uh, look into those jobs and investigate why, if there's an issue, what, what the issue is. Uh, we've, all, we've integrated that with, our, with the Sentry API. Uh, so in this case, for example, I see there's a Sentry model here. So this job was a Zendesk job. I triggered that in March and it had failed. And I see that this, uh, there's a Sentry issue here. So it directly showed up here. Uh, now, as a, as a user myself, I can see that this issue was resolved. Uh, this is only internal, uh, but I can see that this issue was resolved. And uh, uh, 
I can see that it was assigned to the core engineering team. So if I need to follow up, I know who to follow up with. I know who's the owner of that issue. I know how many times it happened, but since this issue is resolved, this probably means that now I can just go in and, uh, and uh, re-trigger my job and it should work uh, well. Uh, now from here, if I need more information, I can always just click on that. It will directly deep link me into the actual issue. So this was for us a really good use of the Sentry API, because at the end of the day, we uh, it helped us reduce the amount of uh, ad hoc questions we get from uh, uh, from solution in, uh, from solution engineers and outside teams outside of core because we're exposing to them the tools that we use internally ourselves to debunk uh, our issues. Uh, so that has has been very helpful along with the ability to pinpoint what team is responsible for that issue directly from the job that they are looking into. We all we do all of that by just pushing uh, the proper Sentry tags and, and identifiers. So each connector job, for example, gets a Sentry, uh, uh, gets a tag that gives it a connector job ID. And then uh, when, we're, uh, when we're loading that page, we just make an API call uh, to the Sentry API saying, like, do you have any issues tagged with that uh, connector job ID? And if we get an answer back, that means, uh, uh, that means there is an issue and then we show it inside of that model. Now, going from here, uh, there's a few things that, uh, uh, that I also use in order to keep things uh, in check. Uh, for example, there's this uh, dashboard uh, that's, uh, that I've built inside of dashboards. Uh, dashboard is a way to build uh, uh, multiple widgets based on queries inside of uh, Jira. Uh, so what I've divided this, this is mostly for myself to see like, what are ongoing issues that we have. Uh, so what I'm looking here is, uh, what are the top issues that are happening? Uh, uh, what is the number of all the issues that's happening? So if there's a big spike, this is something that I could easily identify. All of those are narrowed down by core engineering. So I'm only seeing those for my team across all of our services deploy that for top. Um, and I can also see the list of issues. What's really most relevant here is again, this JIRA integration. Uh, what I can see here is that this issue already has a JIRA ticket and I can go in and check that Jira ticket. Uh, this helped me kind of know, all right, this is something that we are, that is on our radar already. This is not already on our radar. This is probably something you should look into, uh, either resolve or, uh, or if there's anything that needs to happen, any change or any additional research, we need to go and open a, a Jira issue uh, from that, from, from that uh, uh, century issue and tackle it in upcoming sprints. So this, this dashboard has been particularly very, very helpful for us. In addition to uh, the Teams Task dashboard. So that's, that's a new dashboard that has been very useful. Uh, so for example, here, if you go to stats and then go to issues filtered by your team, um, I, uh, it helps me know what, how many unresolved issues we have over time. Unresolved issues have been very helpful uh, because it helps us know, all right, are we getting better or not? Uh, but uh, uh, what's also very important is new and returning issues. For me, this is by far the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest metric I look at. How many new issues are we introducing? How many regressions are we getting in production? And uh, it helps me identify, right, let's just double down on, on, on quality of our code. We move fast, we deploy a few times a day to production, but that should not mean we're compromising quality. And quality is easily measurable. Uh, uh, through obviously many metrics. This is one of the metrics that I use myself. Uh, another metric as well is uh, time to resolution. Uh, so here, actually, we started using code owners around February. Uh, so before code owners, again, we had a big backlog of uh, issues and, uh, and all of them were unassigned. We had no proper way to know whether an issue is for team X or team Y. Uh, all issues just go into a big backlog. So we, our time to resolution for our issues were terrible. Uh, a month, uh, 1.2 month. But then after using code owners, now we started getting a sense into, okay, this is my team's issues. Those are things that I'm familiar with. I have context on this. Let me go and look into it and fix it. Uh, along with the Sentry audits, we started having time to resolution uh, to hours rather than uh, hours and days rather than months. Um, so that's kind of how, uh, how, how, what I use inside of Sentry. Um, 
A few things that we also got out of this is uh, defining internal OKRs or, or service level uh, objectives uh, within our teams. Like we use, for example, uh, time to resolution or new, uh, new issues or even latency. Like uh, here's a good example of latency. So that's a dashboard that measures our search latency. So search, uh, the search, uh, the, the, the internal search uh, that, that powers search for all, all teams at Fortad is maintained by core engineering as well. And this lets us monitor like what is our search latency. And uh, uh, it gives us room for improvement. And then we can set service level objectives that say we are OKRs that say we want to improve search by by X percent uh, latency uh, on P95s. Uh, so this is this is those are kind of the dashboards that I personally use in order to measure our efficiency and and just our performance. And I also use those dashboards in order to report to uh, upper management, CTO, or my 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 direct manager uh, in order to uh, measure how things are going and 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 measure the progress on our. Uh, on our goals for the quarter uh, regarding just quality of, 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 uh, of our code. Uh, so that's a bit of, about our workflow. Uh, Dorothy, if we can go back into the slides, I'm gonna stop sharing. Sorry, one second. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Pull it up. All right. Can you all, can you see this, Chad? Yes. All right. So um, uh, a few things we got out of changing our workflow. Uh, we got more ownership of issues between teams. Uh, a lot less of the game of uh, uh, no, it's not my team. It's the, the different team. Code owners are the source of truth. Maintain good code. Code owners. That means we maintain good uh, centric triaging. Uh, faster time to resolution. Uh, as, as you saw, like our real actual data, we went from months to days of resolution. Uh, release health is very important. Uh, one average, as we're looking at metrics from last quarter, we released 2.5 times a day to production. Uh, in order to keep that release train fast, we need really good monitoring. We need really good release health, really good heuristics. And we really do take that to the extreme. Uh, we take that to the point where at, uh, at one point we actually had a bug where uh, it was, we were preventing errors to go to Sentry. Uh, when we noticed that this bug was happening, uh, the first thing that, that the DevOps team did was block all new releases. Like no releases go out unless we have the, the metrics that we need to determine if that release is good or not. And with those metrics, we, got, we get them from release health. Um, we get the visibility into slow requests, search latency, and uh, uh, like, uh, an example that I give is like improving our search latency by 20, 30%. Uh, that's on P95s. All of that is measurable through, uh, uh, through uh, Sentry performance. Uh, we also, internal apps have been very useful because mostly they, they helped us, as I mentioned, like reduce the number of requests that we get from uh, uh, solution architects that tell us like, hey, this job is not working. Uh, we directly identify to them why this job is not working, if it has been resolved or not, and which team is responsible for that, uh, for that issue. Uh, so this is how we inter integrated in into our internal apps. Um, so those were kind of the direct results that we got in the past few months. Now going into what's next uh, and what we are working on, uh, obviously we've improved a lot, uh, but we're nowhere near perfect. We have a lot more work to do. Uh, that's what worked for us. It, it doesn't mean that will work for everyone, but uh, uh, it's, I would, it would have been very helpful for me to hear uh, what other teams have gone through as we were kind of learning this, they're learning and improving our workflows internally. Uh, one thing that we are planning to improve is uh, on, on call escalation. So as we scaled into multiple teams, we maintain, uh, we have on call rotations by team, but we still maintain the general rotation that acts as a triaging layer. So going back into that workflow where an issue fires more than 10 times in the last hour, we get an on call escalation this goes to the general rotation. The general rotation then usually does a triage. 
uh, is that some is that an issue that uh, uh, is that an issue that's a P0, P1, P2? Based on the issue level, if it's a if it's a P0 or a P1, this means uh, this needs to be taken care of as soon as possible. If that means rollback, the general rotation can handle that. If it's more team specific, then the general whoever is on call primary on the general rotation will go ahead and uh, uh, escalate directly to the teams. Uh, what we want to change in that workflow is we want to remove that general rotation and route our escalations directly to the teams. There's a few implications of that that we're taking into consideration. Like for example, if, serve, if, if core engineering services are having trouble, then uh, other teams will get paged about that. Like let's say our database layer is having trouble, uh, then all teams will get paged. We need to figure out a good way to only think the people that can actually take action rather than have a noisy on-call escalation. Uh, and also have all the alerts in place inside of Sentry in order to have that escalation properly. Uh, another thing that we're also improving is uh, fast ABI support on Sentry. Uh, Sentry has good support for ASGI based frameworks. Uh, a few things that we've noticed that we, we've already, uh, one thing actually that we've already contributed uh, to, uh, uh, to Sentry was uh, to the Sentry Python uh, uh, package uh, is uh, how transactions are kept track of. As we switched from Flask to, uh, uh, to fast API, uh, we used to track our Sentry transactions, like the simple things, like we used to track them by path, but then as we moved into ASGI, we, the, 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 the ASGI module of Sentry was, stacking, was starting to track them by module name. And uh, this gave us, uh, this, this caused a few problems for us because first we couldn't figure out which paths used to be what, uh, and we couldn't figure out how is our latency after the, the switch to fast API. Um, so we had to make the changes internally ourselves and we, we made a pull request on Sentry. I believe that was merged a few weeks ago. Uh, there's a few things. Uh, uh, Sebastian, he's he's the he's the maintainer and creator of Sentry. Uh, uh, so he's been actually working with a few people at Sentry in order to get uh, uh, a few things uh, improved. So that's a bit about uh, what we are planning to do next. Uh, now uh, the next page is more about uh, four thoughts. Uh, so uh, I hope that was helpful. Uh, this is kind of our learning, uh, what we've learned over over the past past few months and and the past 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 year. Um, we are hiring engineers. Uh, we again, as I said, we are growing the team from forty to about seventy five people. Um, we are hiring full stack, backend, machine learning engineers, DevOps, data engineers. There's a lot of more roles that are open. Uh, so if you are interested to solve uh, some of those big challenges with us. More than happy to have a chat. Uh, please go ahead and apply on portal.ai slash careers. And uh, that's all, Adam. Perfect. Thank you. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, one second. Um, cool. My screen should be coming in. Um, so I'll be covering uh, a, a more or less what Jad was saying, uh, going over, but I will also be going over some of the newer things that are coming down the pipeline. Um, so for the purposes of this demo, I'll go ahead and take on the role of an engineering manager um, at a popular uh, media streaming company. Uh, we just did a release uh, in these past couple of days of our React uh, web application. Um, and we could see one of the things we're taking advantage of is Sentry's semantic versioning. Um, this allows us to easily query against particular uh, versions, um, builds, packages. Um, but for now, I'm going to go ahead and focus on these metrics right here on this release. We could see we're actually getting, uh, you know, everything seems to be working, right? 100% adoption, all sessions that are being generated out of this release are being generated out of, um, for this project as well. And we can also see the number of crashes, right? This is essentially unhandled uh, exceptions that the uh, Century SDK has been able to be, um, uh, uh, it's been able to gather. And this crash free rate, the way we're essentially calculating this is we're looking at the number of sessions that resulted in some kind of crash versus those that didn't. And then we're doing basically a simple ratio in order to provide this percentage to you. Um, and then lastly, we are, um, showing the new issues or surfacing the new issues. 
um, that may have uh, arose within this re a release. Um, the last thing I just was going to highlight is uh, we also conveniently provide a 14 day uh, period as well. So 24 hour and 14 day are the two time periods we um, show. So if I wanted to get a little bit more information on this release, I would be able to go ahead and open this up. And there's a bunch of information here, uh, you know, a bunch of helpful information here that I could go over. But for the purposes of this demo, um, I'm just going to go ahead and focus on the new issues that um, had surfaced right uh, during this release. So we could see this internal server error seems to be causing quite a large number of problems, as well as there's a, a couple of other um, issues here that it's going to be worth uh, diving into. Um, ultimately, where this information want, uh, I want this information to go is as an engineering manager, right? Um, I uh, use the dashboarding features within Sentry quite often to kind of guide my team and make sure that we're, you know, spending our time and resources effectively and appropriately on the biggest problems my org is facing. So eventually this will go onto my dashboard, but before I want to do that or before I do that, I may want to do some further investigation on this within uh, Sentry's discovery tool. So this is essentially the query tool that Sentry provides. You have full access to all your projects uh, event volumes uh, within this tool. And as you could see, uh, we have a couple of columns here uh, by default. I'm actually gonna go to the column section here and modify this a little bit. So I'm definitely gonna keep title. That, that's probably helpful to me. I don't really care about this type one. I'll keep project. Um, user display, probably not super important right now. I'll probably take timestamp off. And then I'll add in a couple of additional fields here. So I'm gonna add count. And then as you can see, there's a bunch of other functions and fields I can add. Again, this is basically looking at all of the um, events. So as you can imagine, the, the list here is, could be quite extensive. Um, but what I, I will want to add here is my issue field. And lastly, I could also add an equation, but uh, yeah, I think I'm quite happy with these four. I'm gonna apply these. And when I do that, um, the thing to call out here is that by having this issue column, we actually have the ability to go directly into the part of Sentry that could give me more context about this particular problem. Um, for quick context, for those of you who are new to Sentry, and just in terms of terminology, so what's an issue and what is like an error, right? So think of an issue as kind of an aggregation of similar errors, and primarily Sentry is using stack trace to do that grouping. Um, but that, that's the main issue or main differences between an issue and, and in an error. Um, and so in this case, we have our count, we have an issue, we have the project column title. This is good. And now I have this nice line chart, uh, line graph that gives me a little bit more information here. Now, the cool thing, I have a couple of ways to modify this view. So if I wanted to, I could do something like top period and maybe I'll do like top 10, right? Top 10 uh, issues. So we have that information. But remember what I mentioned earlier is I, I, I eventually want to get this kind of information, this context onto my dashboard, um, because that is where it's going to be the most value uh, or going to add the most value to me. So uh, Sentry makes this pretty easy. We have this little wizard here, add to dashboard. Um, so if I go ahead and click on this, um, I'm going to actually go ahead and change the visualization type now to the table. Uh, I'll go back to table and I'll explain a little bit later on why, why I did this. Um, in terms of choosing my data set, so again, just as a recap of what I was mentioning earlier, but think of issues as kind of the higher granularity data set versus uh, errors being um, uh, more granular. And in terms of kind of when would be most appropriate to use like error events versus like issues, I'd say error events would be something like if you want to have like, let's say a big number tile on your dashboard that would uh, effectively measure, let's say HTTP status uh, codes 200 versus 500, something like that. That would be a good example of when you would want to use the uh, events data set versus the issues data set. You may want to just look at, you know, when was this issue first seen, last seen? Maybe if you uh, have like JIRA set up and you want to be able to associate your JIRA links and tickets to those issues, you would uh, on, a, on a tile, you would be able to do that. So just for the purposes of um, this demo, I'm actually going to go ahead and choose this issue uh, issues data set. And so you could see that um, that the the uh, uh, table here changed. And then I'm going to go ahead and add a couple of additional columns based off what I was talking about earlier. So I'm going to add the links. And then I'm also going to add uh, when was this issue first seen? 
maybe even the last scene. So let me go ahead and add that too. So I'm going to add both of those. And you can see it, it basically update, updated. I have a couple of my issues here that have the links attached to it. I could go ahead and further filter this. Um, so going back to what I mentioned earlier with the uh, semantic um, versioning, I have the ability to easily uh, slice and dice this on a particular release build or version for now. I won't, I won't mess around with that too much, but it's definitely available. Um, and then I'm sorting by a column. So in this case, it's last seen. And then I can easily just now add this to my weekly review dashboard. So that's one way of doing it. But another new thing that Century released that I'm super excited about is this widget library, right? So everything I just did here, kind of manually clicking through, we pretty much just automated all of that. So if I just click on issues for, for review, confirm, and now more or less, I have the view that I was looking at earlier, maybe the piece here that is missing for me is this links. Like I really want to keep this and maybe the, the first scene. But other than that, um, I pretty much have everything I wanted. And I, now I can go ahead, uh, specify the dashboard I want to add this to and add this widget, right? Um, so that is how to use the wizard. Now, if we transition to the dashboard, I already added it um, recently. So I'm not going to add it again, but more or less this tile is the one that we had created. Um, I think it's worth going over the, the view that we're looking at here, right? So this is, again, just to recap, this is the dashboard that as an engineering manager, I would be checking on, let's say, every week to kind of guide my develop my team meetings and help determine where um, we should be spending our efforts, where, what problems we should be focusing on um, tackling for that week or for the next two weeks, right? So in the first top three tiles here, you have essentially the big number visual that uh, Century provides, which is just, hey, give me a single snapshot in time of um, what's going on. So, you know, what's my number of errors? What's my number of unique uh, users? Um, we also have this line chart, essentially uh, showing you the unhandled errors versus handled, obviously unhandled being maybe a little bit more severe. So you may want to uh, keep an extra careful eye on those. What's good about this particular view is that any point of interest that you want to analyze further. So let, let's say we take one of these spikes, um, you can actually go ahead and just click and drag over that spike and see in the entire dashboard kind of mold around that point of interest. So that's pretty cool. Um, the, this tile we pretty much already went over. Um, this view, so going back to the, the narrative, right? I'm an engineering manager, manager at a popular you know, media streaming company, right? So as you can imagine, we have customers throughout the world. In this case, this particular release seems to be affecting mostly just my uh, US-based customers, but we do have this world map view and visual. And then lastly, we have this tile covering uh, more of our performance uh, data, right? So of course, if there's small uh, or slow running parts of our application, we definitely want to track that. Um, and so that's why I, I went ahead and set up this tile. So this is good, right? I, I think, you know, as a manager, I have a really good snapshot into my organization, but I think maybe now that I added this tile, I'm starting to think, okay, well, maybe I want to enlarge certain tiles, like maybe have higher precedence or higher priority in terms of how certain tiles should be visualized here. So Sentry actually just released uh, or recently released the ability to also resize these tiles too. So if I go to edit my dashboard, I can go ahead and put this in the upper right, maybe make this as a banner across the page here, save that. So now this is a little bit more pronounced, prominent on my page. Then I have the rest of the tiles that kind of support this. Um, and then from here, what I can do is I could go ahead and another thing we release is these, uh, you could expand any of these tiles. And the reason that's important is, is because if I wanted to do, let's say some on, uh, on the fly or on fly analysis on like this tile, for example, I could go ahead and expand this. And then again, let's say there's a point of interest here that I want to investigate further. I can now zoom in on that particular piece. And the cool thing about this is this is not affecting the entire dashboard. This is only affecting the uh, this particular uh, tile, right? So, um, in the case of kind of like again on the on uh, kind of impromptu analysis, this is a really cool tool for you to to take advantage of. Um, so, okay, so you know, I more or less I, I looked at my data, I understood where the error or you know the the kind of the, my top issues are or errors are. And I wanna, let's say, set up an alert so that in the future, I can go ahead and make sure that if something like this happens, I'm gonna be ready for it. And so um, in order for me to do that, 
it would be quite easy. I could just open this up and discover. Uh, basically, I'm just prompted to what uh, what I should, uh, which query I should bring in to discover with me. I'm going to go to error uh, handled false. So basically, unhandled exceptions. And then we'll just create an alert. They'll just prompt me, hey, I need to specify uh, an event type. So there's error. And then I'm going to go ahead and create the alert. So there we go. And then more or less, the flow is very similar to what we were talking about earlier. So you would just um, go ahead and provide, you know, let's say if it goes above 20, and then let's say a warning could be something like, you know, 10, and I would be able to uh, attach some actions to here. So maybe a critical could be something like, um, I would want to get alerted via pager duty, and then warning could be maybe something like a Slack, and then provide some names, so like high number error count, and then save my rule. So that's kind of the flow from start to, or that that is the flow from start to finish of how I could, you know, start from my releases page, then from releases go and do some further discovery or uh, investigation discover, add it onto a dashboard, use that dashboard to kind of guide my team and my decisions. And then from there, uh, set up some alerts. So I could be a little bit more proact proactive around this um, going into the future. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Adam, for the run through and Jad for sharing your, your workflow. I think that was super helpful. Um, I know we have only a few minutes, uh, but there is a like one or two questions I do wanna ask from, from the uh, attendees today. Um, one person did ask, and I think this question might be for you, Jad, since it came up during your workflow, um, but uh, how have you ended up managing the transaction rate limit? Uh, I'm concerned of setting the rate too low and then missing out on important troubleshooting info or setting it too high and exhausting our quota. Um, and we did share some documentation that we'll send out afterwards too, but Jad, if you have any additional information on how you manage this, would, would love to hear. Yeah, uh, actually, that's a great question, Adam. Uh, as uh, uh, the, the documentation kind of said it, uh, we use the tracer sampler. I actually checked that while Adam was doing the demo. So we have a century sampling rate uh, that we define as an environment variable based on uh, service. Uh, and then based on that, then we have uh, routes that we override that sample rate for. Uh, so for example, if you have routes that get queried way too much, we reduce the sample rate. Uh, uh, we have like a uh, denominator where we reduce the sample rate for those specific routes. And we also have a list of routes that we just don't want to have, uh, like health checks, for example. Why do we want to use our, uh, uh, our quota on health checks? So we have kind of like a, a, a block list uh, uh, of routes that we maintain, as well as just like modified sample rates for specific routes that are very noisy. And that lets us avoid hitting our quota and usually when we get when you notice a spike and 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 transactions we go in and check and uh, that usually means that a new a new api api endpoint was added and it's it's, it's very noisy and then we just go and override the the, the specific uh uh kind of down, down sampling of of that transaction Awesome, thank you, Jad. Um, so I do want to close out here and just again thank you um, so much, both Jad and Adam, for helping out and sharing your stories and and walking through the Sentry workflow. Um, again, this will be recorded, so we will share this out as soon as we can later today or tomorrow with everyone who registered. And if you, um, those of you who are still on the line, if you don't mind filling out that survey, that would be incredibly helpful. Um, but yes, thank you so much, everyone. I will let you all go since we are almost pretty much at the full uh, top of the hour, but thank you everyone for joining. Really appreciate uh, your, you coming by today. Thanks everyone. Thank you.